I would like to welcome everyone to the first in our webinar series on the day in the life of a leader. We have gotten um, a fabulous response um, nationally and internationally. So we are very pleased that you are here today. Um, my name is Dr. Susan Allman and I, along with Dr. Cheryl Stenstrom, uh, have put this webinar series together and we've got some really exciting uh, individuals speaking with us today and uh, for three weeks in April. So please join us for each of these sessions. This session will be recorded. Um, it will be available on our YouTube site and it, there will be a link on the School of Information Sciences webpage so that you'll be able to get to it. So I will turn everything over to um, Dr. Stenstrom and then we will begin. Thank you, Dr. Allman. Um, we co-chair the uh, School of Information at San Jose State University's um, Leadership and Management Advisory Committee. So each of our subject areas has outside advice committee and uh, that committee, the Leadership and Management one, has um, spoken to us many times about the need for uh, uh, the School of Information to help um, students see a path towards management and management careers. And one of their ideas was that having a, a view into a typical day in the life of a leader might be useful both for students and for those considering uh, signing up and uh, perhaps attending an MLIS program. So here we are today, and I'm uh, thrilled to welcome the first in our four-part series. And I will introduce to you Dana Van Zanten and Heather Robinson in just a moment. As Dr. Allman said, we're going to do um, the presentation and have time at the end for questions. Today's uh, unique format, we're going to do an interview style presentation with questions and answers with both of our guest speakers. Um, and before I introduce them, I would just like to give a very special thanks to Kim Doherty and Jill Cleese at the uh, San Jose State University Career Center who helped uh, Dr. Allman and I uh, put together some of the content and background for this series um, once our uh, committee had suggested it. So on we go. Um, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> our two speakers today are Dana Van Zanten and Heather Robinson. Uh, Dana uh, and I know each other quite well. Um, she uh, is a current student at the School of Information in San Jose, um, however, lives in Ontario. We're both, we share that we're both Canadian, but we met in um, class a couple of uh, uh, semesters ago, and she's since gone on to do an in-depth study on advocacy at her home library, which is St. Thomas Public Library in Ontario. Her title is Manager of Advocacy and Community Development. And prior to taking that on, she worked as a library assistant and a library services coordinator within the St. Thomas Public Library. Before uh, entering the library world and um, uh, continuing to pursue her education uh, by getting her MLS, she had received her Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts in Philosophy. Heather Robinson is, uh, works with Dana. She's the CEO of the St. Thomas Public Library in Ontario, Canada. And she's been working there for 20 years in a variety of roles, uh, including manager of team and uh, children's services, manager of fundraising and community development, public services librarian, and was seconded to uh, be the project coordinator for, coordinator for the renovation of their library building in 2011. So indeed, a little bit of everything at that library. <laughs> Heather um, started her career as a, a page in London, Ontario at the Public Library when she was 14 and went on to work in uh, Toronto. Kingston, Ontario um, at, at the public libraries there uh, after she graduated from library school before coming to St. Thomas. And she was nominated as the Ontario Library Association's Children Librarian of the Year in 2004. So thank you so much to both of you for being here and agreeing to join us for the kickoff of our four part series. Well, it's our uh, pleasure. Thank you. Without further ado, um, Sue, I think we'll go to the next slide and uh, start off on our interview and we'll get to know you a bit through our questions. Absolutely. Okay, so Dana, I think we'll start with you. Um, 
uh, we I uh, ask you some questions about being a leader and then maybe you can pass that over to Heather and uh, the first question is before you were in a leadership role did you have any hesitations about moving into this level of responsibility how did you handle that and uh, once you became a leader what surprised you if anything about your new role okay thank you um first of all thanks so much for having both of us here. We're really excited about the opportunity and it's nice to be chatting with you again, Cheryl. Um, so before I was in this leadership role, um, moving up within the same organization that I'd worked in for quite a few years, um, because we are a unionized organization, one of my immediate concerns actually was moving outside the union. I'd become quite used to working in that environment and the sort of the constraints and the supports that it provided. Um, but I did find that my nervousness about that was fairly quickly allayed because of the supportive nature of the management team that I joined. Um, so that was definitely a concern that was very real for me, but one that was quickly put to rest by the working environment I found myself in. Um, I did also wonder, because again, I worked my way up through the organization that I started in, um, if a move to management would change my relationships with my coworkers. Um, I'd become quite close with some of them and I'd worked with a lot of them for about eight years or so. Um, so I would say, I mean, I've been in this management role for just over a year now and the relationships have changed. I think at the beginning, I thought that not a lot about it would change that I'd be able to sort of maintain my chummy relationships with people and while we're still on for the most part excellent terms there's definitely some boundary setting work that has to happen when you move into a management role and you sort of become more aware of different levels that things are working on within the organization that you need to be aware of when you're interacting with people and I think that that's something that took me by surprise and that required a, a fair amount of mentorship from um, my coworkers on the management team, but that's also been a real opportunity for growth for me, um, both personally and in this role. So again, that was something that was an immediate concern, but that's been something that's provided, yeah, a growth opportunity. And um, yeah, it's it's been rewarding. Um, and the sort of the other sort of immediate concern that I had was the level of increased responsibility, because although I had worked here for eight years, um, my role as a library assistant had a certain amount of responsibility, but joining the management team, you're helping to lead the direction of the library, you're managing staff, there's a lot more that goes along with that. Um, but I found that I actually really enjoyed being part of the decision making process. I still enjoy that. I enjoy hearing what my coworkers have to say, learning from them. I enjoy kind of finding my own voice, expressing that and the feedback that I get about that. It's, as I said before, it's really, it's the kind of team where there's a lot of collaboration, there's a lot of honest feedback, but there's also a lot of encouragement. And again, it's been an opportunity for, for growth for me. So I think if I was surprised by anything, it's by how much I've actually enjoyed the increased responsibility and enjoyed the opportunities that have come along with that because I was at first somewhat intimidated by that, I'll admit. Um, so I guess that's my perspective and I'll hand it over to Heather. Thanks, Dina. <laughs> And I would say a resounding yes to being hesitant about moving into this, uh, the CEO role. I, I mean, I have had leadership roles right from the beginning of my career, including, you know, even on my co-op. I, when I did a co-op out of library school, I was in Toronto and it just so happened that the children's librarian left and all of a sudden I was in that role until I graduated. So it wasn't the leadership part of it that was really frightening to me. It was all of a sudden, you know, being in charge of it all. And, and um, I think that I was extremely apprehensive about the budgeting part of it, even though I had been used to taking care of parts of the budget, I'd never been in charge of the whole budget. But my former, the former CEO, she had worked with me on courses, on budgeting, because she knew that that was one of my apprehensions. That had really helped. And she's, she'd um, put together a CEO binder of what to expect when you were a CEO. And I have to be honest, up until two weeks before the applications were due, and they did have a process whereby they went national, they, they put uh, the posting out for anybody who wanted to apply for it. Up until two weeks, I still was unsure. And it was finally a call from the board chair 
saying, Heather, you are going to apply for this position, right? That really pushed me forward. And I said, okay, you know, Heather, what do you have to lose? And you might lose. And I, that in my mind was okay. I, I think that I could have coped with that. Um, so that's really my journey to being the CEO. Um, as far as once I became a leader, what surprised me is if it's okay to go on to that question. Um, what I found was that you basically take every day as it comes. So I have to tell the, the funny story about my first, very first day as CEO, <laughs> very first day, we had um, a sewage backup in the children's department and there literally was sewage all over the, the bottom floor of the library that it that did damage, that we had to close down the department, that we had to make decisions about, you know, where the staff are going to be um, working because they couldn't work in the basement. So it's, I think in a way that was like trial by fire. It, it was saying to me, listen, every day you're gonna come in, you're gonna deal with whatever, whatever happens and you can deal with whatever happens. You'll just take it step by step. What I also really found out was that, you know, it really emphasizes that your staff is everything. That where you have strengths or where your strengths aren't, theirs are. And by cultivating a relationship of self-respect and respect for others, you recognize that and you work together. So, you know what, I still, my Excel skills are terrible, but I have people on staff who can help me through that. Um, but if, when I was thinking about taking on the role, I was saying, oh my goodness, you can't even do Excel. Well, you know what? You can. There are people who can, and they can get you through th that part of it. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dana to talk a little bit more about what surprised her about the leadership. If you'd oh. like to add any more, Dana. Um well, actually, I feel like I, I kind of addressed the things that surprised me about it, just that I think how much I enjoyed it, how much I found that I did actually embrace it when it wasn't something that I maybe had originally thought that I was planning to do. So I feel like if people are okay, we're probably ready to go on to the next slide. And and, and one thing, one thing, Dana, don't you notice about it is it's nice to have the, the overall view of things, yes. right? To be able to look at the yes. umbrella view and actually have the freedom to make decisions that can come to fruition. Yes. It's a really exciting part of the of a leadership yes. role. That's definitely rewarding. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for being so open about your experiences, about sort of, um, you know, your hesitations and then the surprises and the uh, um, joys that you're finding in those roles too. That's wonderful. I think that gives us a, a really um, very um, frontline and down to earth view of, of what your story was like to get to those roles. I'll move on now um, quickly and say, ask you the next slide, um, which is why did you seek out a leadership role? I don't, either one of you can take that question first. Oh, okay, I'll go ahead, it's Dana. Um, so I actually, as Cheryl mentioned, um, I'm still actively doing this MLIS degree. Um, I'm about halfway through, I'm taking it incredibly slowly. Um, so I started that when I was still working as a, a part-time um, library assistant here at St. Thomas Public Library. And as I started to work through the core courses, um, it really did help me to see how my public library fit into the larger municipal picture and also what a transformational force libraries really are in people's lives. Um, and that kind of renewed and reinforced the passion that I had for public libraries. And I realized that I wanted to be part of the team that was going to be charting the course for the future of this library. Um, and so the position that I'm currently in now opened up and obviously I wasn't done the degree yet. And I sort of expressed to a coworker that I wish that it had become available two years down the road because I would have completed the degree. And she said, you know what, why don't you just apply for it? You're doing the degree, you've worked here for years, give it a shot. Um, and so I did go and actually talk to Heather, who was my supervisor at the time in that role as well. And she really encouraged me to apply to go for it and to see what I could bring to it. Um, and that was why I sought it out. And that's sort of how I got here now. <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll hand this question over to Heather now. And what's really important about hearing how Dana came to be in this role is that when we first envisioned the person, the manager, of, of advocacy and community development, 
we immediately thought it would be a librarian. And when she came to us and when she came to me, um, and we saw the light in her eyes and she said, I, I can remember it clearly. She said, this role is, is made for me. We went back to the table and we said, you know, is this a role that we really need a librarian in? Um, you know, what would be the benefits of not having a librarian in this role? And, and it, it, when we went trolling, would this open the position up for people who had to have amazing skills that they could bring into libraries? And I think that we're seeing that as a trend that, you know, sometimes maybe the librarians aren't always the best person for certain roles in the organization. And that's okay because it makes us broader in our thinking, more creative, more innovative. And so we posted it and she was up against librarians, but the, the light that she had in her eyes translated into an amazing interview and she is fantastic in the role. So I know I'm talking about oh, Dana, <laughs> but um, that's really important to know that sometimes you can advocate for yourself and I hope that you will. Um, as far as, as me seeking out a leadership role, I think, you know, after all the performance appraisals I've had in my lifetime, one of the things that's pretty consistent is people will tell me that I'm visionary, a visionary with my feet on the ground. And so I can't imagine being in a role where I couldn't, I couldn't chart my own path, where I couldn't make a difference. And I remember even the first, when I was interviewed at St. Thomas Public Library, and that was for a children's librarian role, I remember coming out of the interviewing and say, interview saying, I can make a difference in this library. And it's something that's obviously very important in my life. And I think, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how we come to leadership. And, and that can be a meandering road like it was for me, or it can be quick. And you just know that you want to be in a top role and, and you go for it. And that's okay, too. And both have their advantages and their disadvantages. But sort of that's, that's my reason for seeking out a leadership role. And if I can be honest, um, I, I'm at that, that age where I didn't think I could possibly go through trying to work around another CEO and whatever that meant for me. So I, that's just the honest answer to that. I think we're ready to go on. Thank you for that. Um, again, for being so open, both of you, and um, giving us some insight into uh, that the different ways that you can get into a, um, leadership positions. So this question that we, we can see on the screen, the next one again is a two-parter around uh, how you both would define successful leaders, but also uh, a bit about the, how that um, those definitions influenced you and how that's been affected by those uh, leaders under whom you've worked, you know, when you've seen successful leadership. Um, it's Dana again. I just want to say quickly before I answer this question, but um, I do think, and I'm not just saying this to plug San Jose, but I do feel that that the skills that are being emphasized in the course in San Jose are ones that are really relevant for, for leaders. I feel like, you know, when I talk to Heather or I talk to the other members of our management team who did their degrees maybe a little bit, um, a little bit further in the past, the edge, no, I, sorry. Heather, a lot, a but, lot further in the past. But, it's changed, right? Like the content of it has changed, the focus of it has changed. It's very much connected to, to skills that are necessary to today's workforce. And I feel that, you know, I'm very, very grateful that they opened up the position and made it possible for me to apply for it without the degree. At the same time, I would say that being actively in this degree while I'm in this role is the best possible combination for me at this point, because I'm finding that every single course that I'm taking is something that I can directly translate into my day-to-day -day work life, which has been an incredible kind of synergy, I guess I would say. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, and it's, so, and it's Heather, when, I mean, absolutely. I went to library school a long, long time ago, <laughs> hey, but, but even I know that in the library school, the library schools now are, are still struggling struggling with, with what it is that's going to be relevant to those who are actually going out and working in libraries. And we're just seeing what Dana's bringing to the management table and to the workplace in general. And I mean, we're benefiting all over the place. And, and, and she's pointing out things that we should be reading because she's reading them. And so it's, it's been an exciting process for us. Oh, yeah, really. Okay. Um, 
So I can see there's a question in the chat, and I think um, in a way what I'm going to say about successful leadership, I hope, is kind of going to speak to that question as well. Um, so I guess I was going to say one of the things that I found is that it's been really good to be learning and growing together with this management team because as is probably quite clear by now, Heather is new to this particular role um, and the other two people in our management team are relatively new to their roles as well. And that's provided a real atmosphere where growth is possible. Um, so as far as what makes a leader successful, I would say the things that came to mind for me almost immediately were understanding themselves. So understanding what your strengths are and and also understanding where your limitations are. And I think that's where the, the connection to advocacy is as well. When you take the time to get to know yourself and that you know involves like self-reflection in a solitary way, but it also involves being observant of yourself as you interact with other members of your team, with you in, as you interact with the people with whom you're working, you do start, or at least I've found, you start to get a real sense of what your strengths are and you start to own those and you start to feel more comfortable advocating for yourself and understanding when is the right time to push your ideas forward, when is the right time to be listening. It's a real, your confidence starts to grow. And I think that's the combination of being in this role, owning the fact that I'm in this role and being in school. There's just this, this confluence of, of intellectual pursuits and personal growth that I think is, has been really, really helpful. So anyways, as far as a successful leader goes, I think understanding yourself is key. You need to do that. Um, Understanding the people with whom you've worked, what or with whom you were actively working, who who are they? What are their strengths? What are their limitations? And how do you capitalize on their strengths and help create an environment where they can work together to do their best work? And whatever that best work is is going to be defined, you know, by your own strategic plan and your own circumstances. But you want to be creating an environment where these people that you've taken the time to get to know and understand can excel. And I think another thing about a successful leader is they know how and when to delegate. They know when something's best done by themselves and they know when it's best done by someone else. Um, also being able to give constructive feedback because I find one of my tendencies, especially since the people that I manage are people that I worked with side by side, is to just give praise. And when that's due, that's great. But there are times when you need to give constructive feedback and you need to find out how to do that in a way that is going to help people grow and move forward. Um, and also how to give encouragement and praise, but in a meaningful way, connect it to something specific. Don't just always say awesome job, awesome job, which is kind of what I did at the beginning because I didn't want to be perceived as getting sort of above myself because I'd moved up. Um, and I think a leader can help support you through your mistakes. All of us are going to make mistakes, missteps, say something wrong, do something wrong, poor choice. You know, everybody does that. We're all humans. A leader is going to help you work through that. They're going to help you own what you've done, where you are, and work through that to grow. Um, I think also credibility, doing what you say you're going to do, following through on things, not asking people to do things that you wouldn't do yourself. I'm not saying you have to do everything yourself, but being realistic about what you ask of people and not asking them to do things that you wouldn't do yourself. Um, Another thing that I think is really important that, that I think we've seen a lot of over the past while is knowing how to involve the rest of the staff in decision making, but without giving over too much of your own control. And that's a balance that I think we've been trying to walk as a management team for some time. And I think it requires conscious, constant effort. And I think also leaders do need to be forward thinking and visionary. As a member of the staff, it's good if you have those qualities, but it's not essential. When you're a leader, it's essential that you have those qualities. You're the one who is, well, part of the team that's leading, leading the institution forward. You have to be thinking about the future. You have to have a vision for that, and you have to have a map to get there. So those are my thoughts on that. So I'll hand it over to Heather. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Yeah, and I, it's so funny because this morning I was just, I was reading a Brene Brown book, and I stumbled across this. This is what she says about a leader, and I just believe in this wholeheartedly. A leader is anyone who holds her or himself accountable for finding potential in people and processes. And I, that is, to me, the true meaning of a leader. It's, you know, in the end, we're in the, these roles because someone has to be resp ultimately responsible. But in the day-to-day 
running of a library, the, the people who are working in the library in whatever role they hold are holding this place together. So the most important thing that a successful leader can do is, is nurture the relationship with staff. That it's just, it's paramount to anything else. Um, and I, you know, we've, I've been through a variety of leaders. Some of them I would consider, well, I've had some pretty weak leaders for a variety of reasons. I've had leaders who bully and create a fear-based leadership. And so people are tiptoeing around. I've had ineffective leaders who don't make decisions. And I think it's really important that you look at these experiences and say, oh, it would be nice if I just had nice, you know, healthy leaders. But it, leaders are never perfect. And you always learn something about from the negative parts of leadership so and and I think that makes you stronger as a leader but I I emphasize what Dana said and in fact we are working on this right now that you need to first and foremost know yourself um, and that's something I I'm afraid I came to a little later on in life I, and in fact I just took a power workshop with um, a person called Julie Diamond and I was sitting next to a woman and she said Heather, it sounds to me like you need to own yourself, own your strengths. And I thought, you know, my goodness, I got into this far in my career and I haven't owned my strengths. So she recommended going on and doing the Clifton Strengths test. So I came back, signed up, cost some money, did it, and it has 34 strengths on it. And I did, I did the whole nine yards you can do just five and I found out what my top five were and I found out what my bottom five were and I some of them surprised me and then I thought oh yes well so this is it, it explains why I am who I am so then we went on I, I was so enthusiastic about this that I had all of our all of the managers do the strengths test and so we're actually working with um, a consultant right now and we're talking about one another and our strengths and also how we see one another, um, one another's strengths. And that's been really important. And then we're taking the next step at a staff development day and having our staff do the strengths test. And all of this is to gift them with the knowledge, more knowledge of who they are. And that's, that's really important. So we, I mean, we kind of have a, an unwritten rule around here that the best thing we can do is to get to know our staff well enough so that that we know and they talk about what they're passionate about, what their skills are, and we try to interweave those things into our workplace. And libraries are excellent for this. You can interweave a whole lot of skills and talents into a library workplace. And I think, I think we continue to do that. So we're hearing that even, um, mirrored back to us, like they'll say to us, we know that this is a workplace where we can use our passions and our talents. And I think that successful leaders do that. So then of course, in, in a role like mine, you, you have to be a strategist because you're dealing with politics and political figures and your funding, the majority of it is coming from the municipal government in our case. And so we, you have to know how to have a relationship with the politicians um, and still remind them that you have a library board. And sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. So in our case, you know, they help us with large maintenance projects and they do our, our budget, like they, they send checks for us and all that sort of stuff, keep our books. Um, and I sit on the city manager's committee, which I would recommend for leaders to get to know the, their political environment. And I know in the United States, it's different. Um, so I, I think that's really, really important. You have to be an active listener and you have to realize that this job is, is not all high level. Um, sometimes you're just dealing with cracked windows and social issues like, you know, drugs and sex in the washrooms. Um, it's a real mixed bag and that's what makes it a wonderful role at, at one time. 
The other part of it that you have to know about this position and any leadership position where you're supervising people is that the personnel issues are extremely complex and extremely difficult and they take oodles and oodles of time. So the more you can work on interpersonal skills and yourself, who you are, I think the better. So I, I, I think we've pretty well, I think we have. We have <laughs> chopped that one to the ground. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I would um, be remiss if I didn't loop back very quickly and say thank you too for the great plug about the San Jose State School of Information's MLIS program. Uh, and Dana is a star in that program. So um, it's a mutual benefit there, I think. Um, our next question is about uh, uh, what skills you think are most uh, helpful in your role. And maybe we can focus a little um, bit of the on the second part of this question about where you develop those skills as well too if it was on the job or if it was you know your member of your condo board any of those things that you feel really helped prepare you and develop those skills sure I can start there it's Dana again um, I would say I mean given my particular history um, most of these skills have been developed in this job while I've been in school. That being said, I do often draw parallels between being a parent and being a leader in an organization because there are a lot of a lot of parallels there. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, so I would say, let's see. Yeah, I think taking on this role, learning how to take responsibility for choices that I make because I start to see more concretely how they directly affect the people that I'm supervising and um, my members, like my co-members on the management team, that's sort of been a skill that I've been developing. Um, time organization, um, when I was a library assistant, I thought that I was busy and I was busy, but when you move into a leadership role, you're juggling a lot more, a lot more balls are in the air, I guess, at one time. Um, I did actually just take the one unit leadership course here, another plug, because it was amazing. And um, some of the reading that we did was talking about the difference between management and leadership. And what I realized in reading that is that this kind of role, and I'm guessing a lot of roles like this, involve management and leadership. So there's, there's time management, there's managing people, other people's time, there's managing projects, there's managing, you know, your day-to-day -day schedule when you've got a lot of meetings and stuff. But then there's also the leadership aspect, which is, you know, working with people and visioning for the library and setting priorities and doing strategic planning. A lot of it, I mean, I'm learning on the ground and I think that, you know, um, people are capable of that, especially people who have taken the step to, to do a higher level degree like this. That takes a lot of initiative, that takes courage, that takes, you know, a belief in yourself. And I think that kind of, that forms the I don't know what the groundwork, the basis to, to do the other things that you need to learn how to do on the job, especially if you are in a supportive work environment. So, um, and I would say, you know, from the re leadership reading that I did and from my own personal experience, there's tons of different environments in which you can develop those skills. I mean, self-knowledge and working on yourself, you can do that whenever, wherever, through reading, through your relationships with friends, family, children. If you're, you know, in a church group or some other kind of group, take on a leadership role there. And it doesn't have to be, you know, that you are named the leader of that group. It's the way that you conduct yourself there, the relationships that you build with people, the influence that you start to wield, and the, the sort of belief in yourself that starts to come out of, of taking on those roles and understanding that you can influence other people in a positive way and get to know them and, and kind of make things happen. So I would say, you know, any opportunity in a class that you're in at San Jose or somewhere else, you know, in your living room with your family or in any group you happen to be involved in, there's, there's opportunities if you're thinking intentionally and authentically that, that, that you want to grow as a leader and as a person, you can, you can make that happen almost anywhere that you are in any relationship that you're in. So I'm going to hand that over to Heather now. Right. And, and I, I would totally agree with you, Dana, that I think a lot of it is just actually watching power and, and how you use power in every aspect of your life. Um, and this is where good leaders and not so good leaders really need to have a good look at why things aren't working or why they are working. And, and from what Julie Diamond says in her book called Power, A User's Guide, I mean, that power 
dynamic starts in your own families when you're children. And even just looking back and saying, you know, what was the dynamic in my family? It influences your dynamic when you get to school, um, when you're in public school or when you're in high school and, and when you're working in groups in university. It's, they, there's all sorts of power stuff going on. Watch that carefully. And yes, as Dana says, you know, taking leadership roles in whatever aspects of your life you feel you can take leadership roles because you learn so much. And sometimes it's nice to have that learning before you're in like, you know, the CEO position or managing 15 people because it is all, it is a lot about the interpersonal skills, a lot. Um, so I would say, you know, almost anywhere and do read about it and read in different like, like I'm reading a book now about, you know, uh, uh, what horses and watching horses can tell us about leadership. So whatever way calls you to do research, mm -hmm. you know, it, it all is very, very helpful in the end. So I, I, yeah, I think we're ready to go on. Okay, hey, wonderful. wonderful. Um, I'm just going to mute your mic for a quick second. Sorry, I was getting some feedback there. I'll put you back on in a minute. Um, before we just go on, um, I want to say we're going to just skip a, a bit around in the f uh, formal questions here. Sorry, Heather and Dana, I know that's last minute, but I know there's a couple questions here that are really uh, probably burning on people's minds because we hear them from students all the time. So I want to make sure we get to those. And I also want to just pause quickly if anyone has any questions that they are dying to ask at this point before we go on. You can use the chat if you'd like to do that. Uh, perhaps think about that while we're going on, but I'm going to jump ahead and ask you both, um, what kind of supervisory experience did you have before you took on your first leadership role? I know this is a very common concern for people who are considering leadership roles. Uh, they think, oh, well, I couldn't even put myself in that position. I couldn't apply for that because I've never supervised anyone. So tell us a bit about your experiences. I was just going to say I, I, I'll start because um, my supervisory experience before taking on this role was extremely limited, so it won't take me long to talk about it. Um, I started here at St. Thomas Public Library as a library assistant, which was not in any way a supervisory position. Um, and then I covered two maternity leaves as a library services coordinator in our children and teens department. So that was constituted about a year and a half um, and really the leadership that that involved was just supervising and scheduling well just it was supervising and scheduling four part-time staff members and three pages um, but it certainly didn't have the sort of um, strategic planning and visionary components so I mean when I applied for this job I had very little supervisory experience and I went for it anyway and I would encourage people to do that because I think that the relationship that you have with the people that you're going to be working with, what you bring to the interview, um, that can make a huge difference. It's not necessarily, I mean, of course your resume is important. I'm certainly not going to say that, but it's what you bring to the interview and the passion that you bring and your willingness to learn and, you know, the skill set that you do have emphasizing all the strengths you can bring that that's important and you should, you should go for it. Yes, and I, I, Heather, um, one of you asked about advocating for yourself, and this this is part of advocating for yourself, is you know taking roles that have you know functional guidance in them because it's kind of nice in a way, and I maybe this is my own way of going about doing it. It's kind of nice to ease into a, a leadership role. So you know Dana's role, she would identify issues if there were issues with staff to a manager and then she and the manager which was at that point me we would talk about how we were going to handle them and and in the talking about how we're going to handle things you're learning mm -hmm. right yep. um so it, do look for those roles and don't shy away from them um, that's just the thing. If most of the time when you have issues and if you're worried about supervising people, just know that most of the time you're not doing it alone. Um, I'm not doing it alone. I, I consult with HR from the city all the time. Um, so don't shy away from them. Um, and we are now, I think there's a trend that we're doing behavioral 
um, interviewing. That's where we'd like to go because we want people who have the behaviors that we're looking for. Um, we can teach the skills, um, but we want to know that they're compassionate people. Um, it's so in terms of my supervisor experience, like honestly, I didn't even think I, uh, about it being supervisory. Here I am, I'm not even finished library school, just like Dana, and I'm all of a sudden, I think I had three people that I was supervising and I had to come up with programming for children and I had to go to meetings with other children's librarians throughout the system. So like, don't be afraid to be thrown into it and ask for help for the things that you don't know because most of the time, nobody's minding showing you the ropes and helping you along. There's lots of help out there in, in different aspects of whatever it is you're struggling with. Um, and from there, I was like a branch supervisor. So I tried that for a while. And then I was, you know, various roles as you heard in this. And each one of them taught me something, but I always had help, always. And someone to talk to about things. And, I, and hopefully you always will too. So um, I can see there's a question in the chat about finding a mentor. Would you like us to answer that one? Yeah, thanks, Dana. I was going to say that follows along perfectly from Heather's last point. So if um, whoever wants to address uh, leadership and mentorship, that'd be great if you're wanting to do that. Um, I can jump in and just quickly say, um, for me, I mean, I guess I was lucky enough to already be working in a library. And so when I was looking for someone to give me some guidance, I was I did have Heather to turn to because she was my supervisor at the time. So I mean, when I was thinking about going to library school, I went and talked to Heather. When I was thinking about um, applying for this position that I'm in now, I went and talked to Heather and that relationship came about quite naturally. Um, that being said, I think, you can find a mentor probably, I mean, in the same way that you can find leadership experience. Take a look at the people around you. Take a look even at family members or at members of groups that you're part of, or even, you know, a professor at school that you feel that you have a good relationship with and go out on a limb and ask them, tell them what your ambitions are, tell them what you're wanting to do and ask for their advice. I mean, I, I personally would be flattered if someone asked me those questions and I think I can't speak for Heather, but she's nodding, but people feel the same way. I mean, that, that you see them as someone who has something to bring to you and to your journey. I mean, that, that's flattering. So, I mean, look around for people that you respect and admire in any aspect of your life and, and talk to them about what you're wanting to do and see what they, they have to say to you. That would be my recommendation. And if you happen to be working in a library, well, that's great. It works out really well. <laughs> Yes, and, and I know that, um, this is Heather, um, I know that our Ontario Library Association actually has a mentorship program. And so people who want to mentor sign up and then those who want to be mentored in the different aspects of librarianship, and we all know that it's a very broad field, um, there's, there's opportunity for them to, to chat. But as Dana says, your mentor may not be your supervisor or your CEO. I think you have to know your your leader, the, the person you're working for or your CEO or whatever, um, to see whether or not this is the kind of mentorship that you're looking for. It isn't always, but I get calls from people who want to ask questions, who want some advice and in my thinking, you are the future of librarianship and why wouldn't we want to be helping the future? Because if you're, I mean, I'm still as passionate about libraries as I was when I first started in this career and we want it to continue. We want it to be healthy. So why wouldn't we help? Cold call. I mean, if they say no, move on to someone else. You, I can see, I mean, you're from some pretty amazing areas with some pretty amazing libraries. Um, give it a try. Like really? Oh, yes. Somebody is even talking about mentorship programs. Good. Good. Yes. Take advantage of them. All right. All right. I think too, um, it sounds like both of you said, don't rely just on one person to give you all that advice and uh, mentorship. Turn to whoever you need to at the time, it sounds like. Yes. 
I, I really want to get to this next question. Um, so I'd ask Dr. Allman to make sure that we uh, put this on the screen. Uh, the question is, what do you feel is most important for LIS students to know about leadership? Um, I can jump in and start. It's Dana. Um, I would say that doing leadership well involves more introspection and a deeper understanding of human psychology than you might at first expect. Um, I think people may go into it thinking, you know, it's all very skills based and um, the skills Skills are important. I'm certainly not saying that they're not, but a lot of it is about that relationship building piece. It's about getting to know the people with whom you're working on a day to day basis, the people that you're attempting to lead and really getting to know yourself. I think I can't stress enough how important it is to understand your own strengths and your own limitations, because that allows you to be an authentic person. And when you're being an authentic person, then you're able to be an authentic leader. Those relationships will happen more naturally. That being said, you do need to intentionally focus on relationships on understanding yourself the way that you're relating to other people and in authentically getting to know them listening to them understanding where they're coming from and hearing them and hearing does not necessarily have to mean agreeing and i think that was something i would sort of emphasize as well you can hear people without agreeing with them and i think that's an important thing to understand when you're a leader um I think I would also say that taking on increased levels of responsibility, it sounds scary, but it can be incredibly fulfilling. And I think it's it's worth the risk. If you think it's something that you might want to do, I would say go for it because it can be a real opportunity for growth and very satisfying. Um, and also, I guess on a personal note, if you're moving up in an organization, your relationships with your former coworkers are going to change. Not all your friendships are going to disintegrate. I'm certainly not suggesting that but your relationships with people will change. So be ready for that if you're looking at internal movement. I think those would be my sort of main insights. And that, yeah, I guess what we were saying before, you can you can learn to lead from wherever you are and you can lead from wherever you are. So build your confidence, your sense of self, your ability to form trust-based relationships with people, work on those things um, because then you will be heading in the right direction no matter where you currently are in your work life. So over to Heather. Dana. <laughs> How can I follow that? No, um, admit, I, I agree with all of that. It's it, knowing yourself is one of the most important things. Do everything you can to know who you are, to know how you deal with others. Um, it, it, and there are a variety of ways of doing that, but that's so important. And I think that it is true that the higher up you get, the lonelier the position can be. And Dana talked about this um, earlier on that, and she had the experience of going from being, you know, a coworker to all of a sudden being a manager. And you, it is lonelier as you, as you move up. Yeah, and you sort of have to accept that, but it is extremely fulfilling. Uh, this libraries are, one of the most resilient places, I think, because, I mean, we, we were looking at extinction in many people's minds and look at where we are now and we continue to mold and change ourselves to meet the needs of our public and to try to keep up with technology. That takes a lot of resilience. So keep your skills, um, like, do try to keep up with the technology in your libraries. Um, do get to know yourself as well as possible. And also, I think it's really important to learn how to put your ego aside. That bringing your ego to a leadership role, it can be really harmful. So I watch leaders talk about my library and my staff, and I always think, but that's not correct. You know, you're the library staff. We're all the library staff. And, and feeling as though you're all in this together, that yes, you're the figurehead. You're the one who will talk to the press if something goes wrong. You're the one they call when, you know, the roof's leaking or somebody's doing drugs in the washroom. But really, we're all in this together. So the respecting, the respect of other people no matter what their station is really, really important. So I, I think that, yeah, that pretty well covers it. Wonderful, thank you.
Um, this is another really important question that I hope we can touch on in the time we have left. So um, when you're thinking about students uh, who are in the program or thinking about uh, entering the program, what are some ways that you suggest that they can practice leadership skills when they might not have a job that has that title or um, uh, other ways that they can start to prepare themselves uh, to take on that role? Sure, I can start it, Stena. Um, so I think a few of these things have been touched on um, in things that we've been saying so far. Um, one of the first things I thought was observe other leaders and observe the way that people react to them, observe the way that they kind of live out their relationships with other people with whom they work. Um, and think about leaders with whom you're working. What do you like about the way that they're interacting with you? What do you not like? What do you think about the decisions that they're making and the way that like what direction they're taking their organization and really think critically and um, intentionally about those things. Um, I would say, and again, we've touched on this a few times, but I can't, you know, sort of overemphasize it. Get to know yourself. What are your strengths? Where do you think you need to improve and start thinking about what you could do to strengthen yourself? What could you do to, to learn more? Um, oh, and then own what you learn about yourself. When you figure out what your strengths are really own them, believe in them. You do have something to contribute. Um, share your ideas and take risks because you might be surprised by how people react to, to your thoughts and your insights. Um, and I would also say, own what you don't know. Don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to be wrong. Don't be afraid to learn from your mistakes and don't be afraid to learn from other people. Just because you're in a leadership role doesn't mean you have to know everything. It's a wonderful opportunity to come into contact with people who have so much to offer. Um, both the organization that you're working for and you as a growing leader. Take that time, ask those questions, and learn from other people. Humble yourself in that way. I think it's so important. Um, I would say also intentionally and deliberately working on building trust-based relationships pe with people. That can be, you know, family members, friends. It can be people that you're in school with. I mean, from the reading that I've done, to um, in the leadership course that I just took, credibility and accountability are cornerstones of good leadership. And I do believe that from my own limited experience as well. So think about that, um, do reading around it. What would make you more credible? What would make you more accountable? And try to live those things out in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and then, I mean, any context that you can find in which you can practice these skills, like are you in a group? Um, do you belong to, yeah, a church group or something like that? Where can you lead from? Where could you try these things out? And then of course, take on any opportunities for increased responsibility where you're working and try these skills. And I would plump for the, the San Jose leadership course. It really was great. So over to Heather. Wonderful, thanks, Dina. Um, I think one of the things that leaders, I know I struggled with and that is fear. And I think that Working through fear, I know this is a often a career that is maybe not so much anymore with the technology part, but it used to attract a lot of introverts. And I remember being at a conference and the speaker saying, listen, you need to speak. We all need to speak. It doesn't matter if you're afraid of public speaking. You have to find a voice, you have to get out there and you've got to do it. So, I mean, I was a painfully shy person. I still am in my heart of hearts, but in order to be a leader, you have to find your voice and you, you have to use it. And it goes with, for a lot of skills in leadership. You know, when, when your boss asks you to do something, like in my case, it was uh, renovate the, uh, to coordinate the renovation of a library. And she said, I think you can do it. And she said, what do you think? I'll give you time to think about it. But I just said, yes. And it was the best thing I ever did. Was it easy? No. But it, I mean, amazing skills came out of that. Amazing knowledge of things that I had nothing, no knowledge about. And it just makes you a broader person. So I would suggest say yes and use your library associations. I know they have student rates. I know they have mentorship programs. I know that you know they, 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 they allow you to go to conferences for less money. Do that because you make, you make, con you make um, contacts. Ask for people's business cards. They could be potentially your mentor. They could be potentially your next employer. So say yes, take chances. 
believe in yourself and uh, be assertive about yourself. So I think, I think we've answered that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Uh, just before we get on to our last question, I want to um, open the floor again quickly. If anyone has a burning question that they want to ask of Heather and Dana. And perhaps while we're they're thinking about that, um, you can see on our screen, I'd like to ask you if there's anything that you'd recommend people read, a book or two, or uh, Dana, you talked about you're doing a lot of uh, reading, presumably good articles that have uh, influenced you. What do you suggest? Oh, sure. Um, so I have a couple of suggestions. It's Dana. Um, there are a lot of great articles on leadership from the Harvard Business Review. Um, so I would suggest going online um, and searching leadership. Um, you can do that, um, I think, through the San Jose databases or through the, the Harvard Business Review website, because um, there's some wonderful articles in there. Um, I would also suggest um, one book that I really found helpful was Drive by Daniel Pink. Um, another one is Influence by Robert Cialdini. Um, those are both about just understanding how people tick. And I think it's helpful for getting to know yourself, helpful for getting to know other people. Um, and a book that I just read for the leadership course that I keep going on about was um, Credibility by James, I think it's Kutzis and Barry Posner. And that is, um, as far as I understand it, one of the kind of um, seminal books in the field. And I found it incredibly influential in my thinking. So those would be, I guess, my top three books and some recommendations for articles. And I'm just, I'm this Heather, I'm gonna plug uh, Julie Diamond's Power, A User's Guide, because in it, you actually can work through, it's, it's a fairly lengthy process, but it, the entire um, questionnaire is in the back of the book and you can figure out what your power print is. And I think that's really, really important. It's all about, you know, knowing thyself, right? So um, pick that up. It's really, it's really a great book. Thank you. Sorry, just to lag there while I was typing those um, authors and titles into the chat for everyone. Uh, we are coming up just two minutes to the hour. So um, I'm hoping if anyone has a last question, they put it in the chat now. We don't want to go over time. We know people have to leave. But in the meantime, I want to thank uh, Heather and Dana so very much for joining us for our series and for being so candid and open and um, informative about their jobs and their experiences and hopefully inspirational to those of you who are considering a leadership role. Any last words, Heather and Dana? You know what, if anybody wants to contact us, we are we are more than open to being contacted. Oh, absolutely. Yes, answering questions. We're just really pleased to be here. Yeah, it's an you. honor, thank you. Well, thank you both so much, and thank you to our participants. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next three uh, webinars in the series. Uh, we have a question here about a list of topics for upcoming web webinars. Uh, if you go to the San Jose uh, I, School of Information website, we do have a list of all of our upcoming speakers. We're going to be featuring the University Librarian from the King Library, uh, Kelvin Watson from Broward County Library, and Melissa Fraser Arnott from the um, Library of Parliament in Canada. Uh, so um, we will be, however you found out about this webinar, you'll see the links for those upcoming series uh, pushed out to you through the uh, marketing team at the iSchool as well too.